Hello and welcome to another edition of the Paranormal Concept Show. I'm your host, Paul Work, and as, as always, we are joined by Kerry Greenway and Richard Clements. Hello, guys. Hello. 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 I'm not just saying they gave us a posh today. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, well, I was just coming in after Kerry's rather posh. Hello. <laughs> I'm rubbing out the pure British today. <laughs> well, yes, what, 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 what? <laughs> well, we are going backwards in time a little bit, aren't we? We, we are a bit today. Yeah, we're, we're going to be um, discussing H.G. Wells. Yeah. Ooh. Interesting Ooh. concepts he brings to the table, does old H.G. Yep, he sure does. Um, especially with it, obviously, his writing, not his blog, uh, not blogs, uh, books. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure he would have only would have been a blogger back in the day. <laughs> I'm not sure he would have, yeah. Well, Definitely. I think he's he, uh, more likely to write books than blogs, but Paul has written a blog on HG Wells, everybody, before, you know, before we go any further. <laughs> 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 because this is one of your favourite authors, isn't it? He is, yeah. And, you know, when, when I was um, looking into him and stuff, um, I actually found out that he was, um, you know, he was born and raised in my neck of the woods. Yeah. Um, in Bromley. So, Ooh, yeah, so he's quite so, a rough man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, I know, I know all, all the places he would have hung out, and I probably did exactly the same, followed in his footsteps, you know. Without even realising it. Exactly, oh God, yeah. <laughs> Now, Maybe is... that's why I sort of found him so fascinating, and especially the the books that you've written as well. Yeah, because he is an author that's like ahead of his time, really. I mean, yeah. he was born in 1866, um, and, but what the concepts he brought to the table were way ahead of his time in regards to content, weren't they? Yeah, well, was... Richard knows more about those. Well, yeah, I certainly feel sort of like um, like any author. He was affected by the times he lived in, but he had a very unique way of sort of sort of putting his thoughts down. But uh, he sort of chose the science fiction route, which, quite frankly, in this genre, wasn't even called science fiction back then. It was sort of just sort of uh, sort of romance, fantasy. F- um, and fiction and it seemed to be classed as but sort of like on in retrospect now uh you look back on hg uh, wells's work and it is actually sort of uh he he has earned the title of being the father of science fiction well with concepts yeah. like war of the worlds on the table the invisible man you know we've got um the time machine on the table, and those those are the the ones we're really going to be concentrating on today, because he, you know, he, those are very very relevant in today's um, situations as much as anything else, and they bring so many interesting concepts to the table. So this is going to be <laughs> not so much a biography of H. G. Wells, but more a discussion um, on the concepts it brings up, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Certainly, I'm looking forward to getting into this one. There should be some interesting conversations going on, and I know it's your favourite subject, Kerry. Well, snore fest. <laughs> anyway, let's talk about. Let's go for the big one: the War of the Worlds. It's it's well known. It's been adapted for TV, screen, film, musicals, stage theatre, just about everywhere that you can imagine. Even a radio show at one point, um, yeah. which you know was a, supposed to have caused a bit of a stir at the time. But actually, when we looked into it, it was the media that made it a stir, not so much actual real people. A few people had a phone, few phone calls, but that was about it. But the media made that out to be more than it really was, which kind of is, that in itself is quite relevant right now, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Little bit of mine. Urban... Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a bit of an urban myth of its day, really, sort of what we think of that famous broadcast now. And it, um, and as you said, Kerry, it didn't really sort of pan out like that. No, no I mean, go, I mean, go, going back, obviously, to, uh, as far back as uh, 1897, the novel was actually split into a series of short weekly stories, um, and it was published in certain magazines in uh, the UK and the US. And I think that sort of, I, th- I think, you know, it was almost like, um, didn't it scare a lot of people? Well, as, as I say, it was put out, not so much the magazine articles weren't really picked up. It was when it was put into the radio format 
that mm. um, but there were disclaimers at the beginning of the show there were disclaimers in the breaks there were disclaimers all the way through it a few people caught it mid broadcast and, and we were a bit like should we be worried about this <laughs> you know and there was a, there was a couple of phone calls made to the police and that but the media blew it up into people are leaving their homes and going to the hills <laughs> kind of thing and that really wasn't really the situation at all um that's so, very unlike the media isn't it i think totally uh. sensationalized the situation um really headline news and stuff like that which over something that really really wasn't what they said it was which yeah mm. you know as uh, fake news or or sensationalization of fact is uh, mm. is well known by the media and and <laughs> I'm not going to say my personal opinion on this, but there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Needs to be dealt with everybody. Anyway, back to HG Wells. But the actual concept of the book itself is is fascinating. I mean, i.e., you know, um, science is in its early stages, you know, cosmology and stuff like that. You know, you've got scientists looking at that. And then they see flares coming from Mars, meteors, they yeah. think, landing. Turns out to be, ah, hashtag aliens. And then <laughs> big war, we're outnumbered, we're outgunned, we're out technology, we're out everything. And we're basically looking like we're going to be wiped out. Yeah, that, that's pretty much it. And the only thing that sort of saves the day is a pesky old virus. <laughs> Funny that. <laughs> <laughs> Funny that, yeah. Yeah, yeah they, caught, they caught the cold, didn't they? The common cold. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh dear, it's just so relevant. So anyway, the concept of life on other planets has been a concept that we've talked about several times. Now our views, my view is I do not discount the fact that there could be life on another planet or there is life on other planets. My problem is the travelling bit. How they get from one planet to another. And yes, if they could have that technology, I don't discount that they may... However, would they be friendly? Would they not? Remains to be seen, because we don't know this for sure. It's another theory, isn't it? Even though some people would swear blind on the Bible that it's true. Absolutely. And, you know, I've I've written a blog on interstellar travel. And theoretically, it is possible. Um, At the moment, scientists are investigating the possibility because they, they were like... Their idea is to launch a spaceship into orbit and then on a laser beam, uh, no, they'll erect a solar cell and then they will fire a laser beam at it, which then should, in theory, push the the cell and the ship at the speed of light to wherever it's pointing. Mm Mm-hmm. That, uh, even, that's sort of the theory behind it. Okay. Obviously, even, that's more layman terms, so I can understand it. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> that's that's sort of where they're going. With, that that was one particular theory that they're testing out, and that's going on as we speak. Oh. Mm. But even uh, sort of uh, travelling at the speed of light, you're still looking at incredible distances, you know, to actually sort of get anywhere of any relevance. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I know. Uh, the closest... I, I think. They might be aiming for is it Alpha Centauri, mm-hmm. which is the closest planet to us that they reckon can hold life. Um, you know, so I think that, and that's about, I think eighty thousand light years away. Well, yeah, so it would take eighty thousand years travelling the speed of light to get there. Yeah, so mm. yeah, and, and this is my main problem with the whole concept of of space travel you know we 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 get to the moon and we can get back down again but Mm. we've kind of only done that really once and we've got people up there in space floating around on a space station haven't we yeah in a low orbit yeah yeah but and but that's hard enough do you see what i mean but that's with the technology we've got today that we also you know i I understand that that's only with our technology there could be a race out Mm. there that's hell of a lot more technologically advanced <laughs> I, I, I kind of look here and I go okay so if they came down to earth and they looked at earth and yes you know if we went to another planet we would take specimens and you know we'll do all the the exploration bit I kind of get yeah. that but I also kind of think 
they might turn on their heels and go, oh, my God, they're nowhere <laughs> near ready for us. They, you know? they probably would. Absolutely. Uh, I would. Yeah. I'd be I'll like, be... you know what, dealing with them is too stressful. <laughs> you, you can't be yeah. with anybody. You know, I, mean, <laughs> I just think, oh, my Lord. Re- what would what would they think? If they came in peace, this is, of course, you know, if they came to, like, conquer us, like it does in, in the book... Then they don't really, they're not really going to care. They're going to go, great, argue with each other. That makes our job 10 times easier, you know. <laughs> Precisely. You know, but, um, you know, what do we think of that? Do you think then, are the human race ready for disclosure if we, if governing bodies on this earth now know for a fact that aliens are able to do this space travel and come to earth, do we think the human race is ready for full disclosure? Um, as a whole, I would say no. But there are pockets of people that are ready. Um, you know, but they've they've got yeah, it's, it's got to grow to a, like a whole worldwide thing. I, personally, I don't think we'll ever be ready. So there's got to be a point where they turn around and say, "Well, it's the minority that are not ready. We're just going to have to do it." Well, yeah, I think uh, me personally, it would not sort of phase me in the slightest and if an announcement's made. We've had big announcements in the past, perhaps nothing of bigger consequence as sort of life, you know, the yeah. proof of life. But, you know, us humans are quite sort of versatile and we can take knocks and sort of stuff like that. And we are sort of like confronted with news and stuff. And generally we do seem to accept it. There may be a little bit of rufflings at, um, and at the start, but generally as a species, I think we're quite accepting of the situations which are, which are placed before us. Mm. Oh, I totally disagree with that. Oh, well, here we go. I don't think we're ready for... I don't think the human race would be ready for that at all. I don't think they can cope with normal human problems, let alone you know, alien problems. I suppose it would depend on intention, though, wouldn't it? The intent of said alien. If they came what? down all love and light and, and we're going to help you and here's this technology and here's that technology, and I just think there would still be suspicion, even if they were, like, completely benign and lovely and helpful and, you know, whatnot. <laughs> I still think that, that there would be suspicion. And I, I actually think the way the media... And I'm not just talking about t- yeah, I'm not just talking about um, newspapers here. I'm talking mm-hmm. about um, the propaganda in regards to um, books, uh, you know, like War of the Worlds, like V. You know, there's plenty of other series where you know the aliens are naughty. They're bad. They're going to kill us. <laughs> and oh my god, and ah, run for the hills, kind of kind <laughs> of aliens. You know what I mean? And even in more modern adaptations of of this theme of humans interacting with other life, like Star Trek, for example, where they come across good and bad, and, you know, some we work with, some we work war with, and, you know, mm. stuff like that. I even think even on that level, there's that level of, it would depend on the intent, but even the intent would be suspicious to us, because well, that is inherent in, in human. human yeah, because we often talk about that uh, for them to actually visit us, they would have to have really advanced technology. And if alien technology advances the same way as human technology has advanced, let's face it, our technology advances through war. I mean, uh, our sort of everything we take for granted these days, like we're speaking over Skype now, you know, and stuff like that. these sat navs and stuff like that. These technologies were originally developed for warfare and they sort of filter down to us. So going on that premise, you would sort of I would suggest that an alien race, race with the advanced technology, their technology, and they would have reached that advanced stage through being pretty much like us, sort of like See, a warring I, sort of race. I can understand where you're coming from, but at the same time, you know, they've got... They, they could possibly have elements that we've never even heard of. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it, it could also be more of a scientific advancement for mm-hmm. the good of their kind. 
because they've got you know, uh, they might have different environmental issues than we do. Mm-hmm. You know the the chemical com- compounds and stuff might be different. Yeah, the elements could be different. They, you know, I, I think isn't it something like we it, on Earth we've only got like one percent of gold on, in the planet. Mm-hmm. Um, they they might have the other ninety nine percent. We we don't know, but it, it's just a, still a possibility. So that you know, their whole system would be different to ours. So their their technology more is more advanced because of that. Could it? But you know, so they might not have gone through the same process as we did. No, that's a, well, that's a fair point, isn't it? That is a good point, you know, we don't know, but, you know, I think when you talk about an alien life, uh, sort of like, and even the way um, we're talking about it, we still find it very difficult to sort of break out of our frame of reference of what life is and how it is. Well, that's it, because we've only got this stuff. We've only got this reference to make, you know. Yeah. Yeah. We have to compare to ours. But thinking, for me, and thinking about it, And logically, uh, if you sort of like uh, think about an alien race and civilization, uh, to be quite honest, I don't know what their intentions are or anything. I mean, let's face it, we don't know. But we don't even know at this point if it's even possible for alien life forms to be out there. No, we don't. I would say the probability of chances there is, if, Mm -hmm. you know, if we are able, if we have gone through that evolu- evolutionary, can't even say it, ev- <laughs> that word. That evolutionary word. process. Thank you very much for <laughs> filling me in there. Um, if we've gone through that, there's nothing to say that other planets haven't gone through the same thing. Just because we haven't got any in our own system, our own little solar system, doesn't mean mm-hmm. that other solar systems haven't had that same processing. You know, that's, yeah. how that's processed, as Paul says, would depend on... on the environment and the planets and the mm. chemical makeups and all that. So he's right. It could be. So, yeah, I mean, uh, carry on. I, I'm quite obviously. I mean, you guys know that I, I do like Star Trek and Doctor Who and things like that. And it does make you think outside the box when it comes to other life forms and other civilizations. Um, I mean, Star Trek, for example, they they do stories on. Um, like a life form that isn't exactly the same as ours. There was there was one um, episode I remember was um, it wasn't a carbon based life form like what we would think of life, um, and it happened on a planet that they were doing mining on, and they were actually mining this life form and using it as energy, um, and then they found out that it was actually a life form, so they were like, no, you've got to stop doing that. Mm. But it, it makes you think outside the box. I think the problem. I think you're totally right there. You have to think outside the box. You can't. We are very used to thinking within our frame of reference, like Richard yeah. said. So you yeah. do have to sort of think beyond that. But without mm-hmm. having visited a planet and seen the chemical makeups, we can look at our own from afar. I mean, the only one we've actually visited is Mars yeah. and mm-hmm. the Moon, right? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. The Moon is completely devoid of anything apart from rocks, right? Yeah. More or less. Mars yeah. is looking, from what I understand, and I'm not a great authority on this topic, more interesting. And they think that it was a more living planet until relatively recently. Mm-hmm. 100 millions of years life spans. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I suppose. Um, I, I find all of this subject very hard to translate in my head i find it very hard to rationalize because in in my frame of reference in our solar system there is no other planet that is capable of sustaining life apart from us yes um uh... again that no that that's if you say for example you was to go and visit mars right Mm -hmm. you could because of the environmental issues Mm -hmm. on but what they're looking at is um like setting some sort of like almost Eden project like building on Mars so that you could live inside that biodome. Mm-hmm. So that's not te- li- technically that's not living on the planet though. Well, it's not living above it, is it? 
No, but it's not being able to live like you would. No, no. You know but what then, I mean? You'd have to have some form of environmental dome to Oh, yeah, ab- absolutely. You'd have to, have to do that to combat the environmental issues. Yeah. The only way they could do that is by terraforming. Mm. I don't exactly know what would be involved, but it would be like changing the atmosphere and stuff like that to be able to make it like Earth-like conditions. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't even know if that's possible, but I think that is possibly what they were looking at at one point. It's certainly something um, I remember being uh, spoken about, you know, sort of like the terraforming of Mars was uh, quite a popular idea at one point. I haven't heard much about it uh, recently, but... Yeah, I think uh, that spawned a couple of uh, novels as well, sort of off the back it, of that. It but. has. I mean, you, you see it in movies as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know. um, Again, it's very sci-fi feeling, isn't it? It's very sci- science fiction. When you think terraform and it's a science fiction concept because it, we, it's not something we can achieve. We can achieve <laughs> an environmental dome, biodome, on Earth, yeah. but we've mm-hmm. not yet managed to translate that or transport that and put it onto a different planet. And that's just biodoming. That's nothing to do with like changing an entire planet into a living, breathing, accessible environment. You know, and, and so it's very science fiction. They can talk about it, but yeah. it's not possible at this stage. No, at this stage, I mean, any forward thinking in the science community is always going to be science fiction until they can break it down and take steps towards it. I think there's a tendency in the way we humans are, sort of like, you know, we tend to want it all at once, you know. We go for the science fiction sort of scenario, life and other planets, aliens travelling, and this is sort of what we seem to strive to try and find. But, you know, I think we're sort of... And we're getting at this the wrong way round. We we really have to establish is there sort of real basic life forms on our neighbouring sort of planets first and then sort of start to build on that instead of just going to the far sort of thing, you know, of advanced civilizations and stuff like that. I mean, and to me, that doesn't make sense. I think you need to sort of, you know, and if you want to take this subject and build on it, you need to sort of think a lot closer to home and sort of get back to basics instead of sort of heading off to the real extreme technological and, and science fiction aspect. Of See, an- another, uh, another really good example of that, again, go- going into Star Trek, there's a, um, they've got a device that um, obviously transports stuff from one place to another, um, but then along come our 3D printers, Mm. And it's pretty much the same thing. Uh, it, it, um, it's the food replicator that I was thinking of. That's it, not transport device. Uh, the food replicator, they basically go up, tell them what they want, and it just materialises. It's, on principle, the same sort of thing as a 3D printer. Which is you type in what you want. Which is actually being used up in the space station at the moment, isn't it? The 3D yeah, printer. Yeah. You know, they want Absolutely. a tool, so you they just can't go up. physically pack every single tool they might possibly need up there. They've got That's a 3D right. printer and they do it, they type it in of what they want and, I don't know, somebody somewhere does something and <laughs> the next thing they've got one. And exactly. it, it's an, that, when that blew it my works. mind, actually. It when works I on the same principle. You know, you, what, you need something, you type in what you need and it makes it. it I'm, still, I'm still quite interested in the food one. Yeah, I really do okay. with a McDonald's right now. No, I'm still hankering. <laughs> I'm still waiting for your Mackey D's. <laughs> but it's, it's just it's just one more step towards that goal, isn't it? That that's the point I'm trying to make. No, I understand. Yeah, I get it. You're trying to you know you're totally right. It is another step forward. We never, but in the 1960s, that would never have been conceived of. No, when no. they were landing on the moon, what they went up mm-hmm. with. When you look now, funnily enough, we were talking about this yesterday, and um, when you look at some films that are even, oh, I don't know, 10, 15 years old, and you look at the technology, like computers that they were using and stuff like that, and you look at them and you think, that's so old. Yeah. yeah. Stuff really dates quickly now. You know, I was watching an old episode of The X-Files and the size of the mobile phones made me chuckle. <laughs> mm. 
Yeah, yeah. It's just things like that. And it's not all that far back, as you say, Kerry, 10, 15 years ago. Life, I mean, technology now really does move a pace. So, so quickly yeah. sometimes that, you know, when you work in IT, it's hard to keep up with because it's moving so fast. Yeah. And that's the stuff we know about. You know, that's just the stuff that's like Paul said, is filtered down or you said it's filtered down to, to us little layman people down here. You know, <laughs> from God knows what they've got technologically advanced behind the scenes. Well, I mean, the Internet, for example, that that was well in use well before it became public. The the American government used it, didn't they, for to keep in contact with all their military bases? I thought that was just wireless. Like, um, not wireless. No, no, it was the internet. It was it was invented well before, you know. We're we're talking like seventies. Wow. Mm. I don't know. I don't know about that. Yeah. Anyway, let's get back to the concept of H. G. Wells and he was on the internet. The thought, know. right? That aliens can visit us from other space. If we've kind of gone off planet, I mean, let's bring it back to this one. How much truth do you think is there? in regards to the UFO sightings that are seen. Because not a day goes past on my news feed from various ufology people around the world saying mass sightings here, mass sightings there. You know, what with all the satellites and God knows what that's, that we're now putting up there, how can we discern between what is a genuine unknown phenomenon in the sky, possibly an alien aircraft, to... Something that's actually explained. Or do you think they can all be explained? Where do we sit with the, oh. that concept, guys? Because that's a biggie. I, I don't think they all can be explained. I think uh, YouTube owes a lot to it. I actually feel now anything that appears online, sort of like uh, that's posted up via sort of particularly um, and social media channels and stuff can be discounted. You, there's just too much out there. That is, that is fake photoshopped and stuff and this is where we've become trapped in our own technology so to speak it is very easy to fake and uh, you know and it even fools the experts so I you know I think we really have muddied the water so much that if there is anything genuine out there that is being captured uh, we are just ignoring it it just gets swept away with the rest of it as, as sad as that is I mean, yeah, no, I, I, I tend to agree that uh, technology's not our best friend sometimes. For no. That being... No, I mean, it's very difficult to discern these days what's real and what isn't real, what with, you know, the CGI and Photoshop and God knows well, what's yeah. out there. And that's just the things I know about everybody. Do you know yeah. what I mean? But in all of this whole pandemic, the, the Pentagon did come out, allegedly, and say... There's a couple of pieces of footage we can't explain, and these are done by high yeah. military personnel. I mean, mm -hmm. one of that particular footage that they, they sort of said we don't know what it is, I'd actually found a site that had debunked that piece of footage and said it was like um, it was a perception thing, that the thing mm -hmm. wasn't moving mm -hmm. as fast as they, they said it was, and it, on the radar it looked like it was something different to what it was. You know, so I have to say I take it all with a pinch of salt. I, I think, you know, the, the only discernible way that you could do that is in, to investigate every piece as it comes out. But that is going to be so time-consuming. Mm. It's, it's not feasible. And I think, you know, it's just easier just to say no. But there are whole societies <sighs> that look at this. I mean, we have, like, we've talked about plenty of times SPR and ASAP and that, like the paranormal and sci mm -hmm. But there is MUFON and, and societies like that which come out of the conspiracy theory world and take it to actually looking at cold hard footage and seeing if there is anything based in that. And there mm -hmm. are some well-known accounts of encounters with something that couldn't be explained. Do we think those are military operations that are secret military operations that they, it's easier to label it as, yeah, let's everybody think it's a UFO rather <laughs> than like admit that it's a secret new kind of technology we're trying to develop and we messed it up i'm sure the military do sort of use that you know they will sort of perhaps if they're testing v 
various stuff and they're testing it more overpopulated um, areas, I'm sure they will just sort of let the, the public come to their own conclusions on what it may be, you know. And Because let's face it, ev- and, and every country and every military does have to keep stuff secret. I mean, and whether you yeah. like it or not, I mean, I mean, I'm glad they do, you know, because you can't, you know, you can't have your secrets sort of being shared about uh, willy nitty. I mean, you know, that's just a fact of life. But uh, as far as sort of like the military go, as I said, uh, I'm sure they would use that, but they probably don't go out to to deliberately do it, but they probably won't say a lot when people speculate on what it may be. No, I mean, I remember we was up Hadley Castle one night and um, at the time there was talk of the Aurora, which was the triangular type plane that has a sonic boom, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And I just saw it. At the time we didn't know what it was, but a few years later it came out and I was like, oh, I saw that. That's what that Mm -hmm. was. At the time I was like, that's a bit weird. Never heard that before. And obviously the sonic boom you hear after, don't you? Yeah, you you hear sonic booms. So you see the triangular shaped dark object going past in front of you. You think, did I see that? Was that? Mm -hmm. It was at night. So you're like, what's that? What what was that? And then you hear the boom and you go, I'm sure that was a sonic boom. (laughs) (laughs) It was one of those. I didn't go, oh, hashtag, I just saw a UFO. You know what I mean? But I just thought, that's a bit strange. You know what I mean? I didn't jump necessarily to the automatic assumption that it was an unidentified flying object. I just just thought it was a bit weird. And just actually, I think I probably thought military. Yeah, I mean, uh, this happens a lot up north uh, of, of the country, sort of in the Midlands and beyond, where a lot of uh, fighter jets are actually stationed to intercept the Russian uh, bombers that often fly sort of close to the territory just to test our systems and they will scramble and they will go supersonic uh, because the technical rule is you're not allowed to go and supersonic over a built-up area or over yeah. land but when you're scrambling fighter jets they will go s- and supersonic and pretty quick and this is why you get a lot of accounts of uh, sonic booms and stuff sort of like from the north of the UK as opposed to down here in the south. Do we automatically assume then that anything Sonic Boom is actually us now? Have we More moved or less, on? Have we yes. pretty much come to that mm-hmm. conclusion? Have we moved on yeah. from that? Yeah, it, it, and it can be anything. It's sort of predominantly a man-made uh, a Sonic Boom, but you think about the amount of sort of space junk that's up there now that's coming down. Mm-hmm. You know that causes a lot of problems, and that's known about. And uh, even uh, meteorites sort of coming in. And they don't have to be that big to sort of generate a noise or a sonic boom. I mean... No, it just I... travels faster than the speed of sound, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. I mean, I saw a meteorite when I was living in Australia and it made the most funny... And I heard it and before I actually saw it and it made the most bizarre sound ever. It was like... Uh, I don't know. It's like when you swim underwater in a swimming pool... And you hear that funny sort of whooshing sound and in uh, in your ears, and it sounded just like that. And I couldn't work out, and I looked up, and I just saw this meteorite sort of burning out. So there's certainly a lot the, of stuff. There was a little alien sitting on top <laughs> going, wee! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was quite something to witness, you know. But, uh, yeah, but it, did, but it actually sort of electrified the whole sort of area I was in as it sort of like streaked across. It's quite an unusual experience, but there's nothing yeah, I, mean, I put I, down to being... I've seen shooting stars and stuff, but yeah. nothing like that. But nothing I put down to being alien. You know, I mm, recognised yeah. it for what it was and, and straight away. Mm. I have to say, I think this is one of the hardest things because you do have a hell of a lot of people out there that believe they have either encountered a spacecraft of unknown origin, mm-hmm. abs- actual aliens themselves, little great... Well, there's about nine or ten different species I think I've come across on the internet... You've had abductee um, accounts time and time yeah. again, alien implants down to the men in black. There are well-documented um, encounters with mm-hmm. something that would not be classed as human. I mean, I've spoken to a few people over the years, and it's one of the hardest things I get my head around because I've never... Again, we talk about frame of reference, don't we? Yeah. 
Yeah. I've never experienced anything like that. I've never had, like, missing time without alcohol involved. <laughs> 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 I've never had a strange aircraft where I could go, oh, my God, that was super weird. I've never <laughs> had an encounter with anything organic that was out of my frame of reference. Is it because it's out of your frame of reference, it might be something explainable, but because you can't, because you've never come across it before, it becomes alien. If, does that make sense? <laughs> I, well, I do think people jump to that conclusion because it's so media driven. You know, if you see something in the sky that you can't explain, rather than going, oh, that could be military or that could be something completely innocent, you would jump to that conclusion that it's alien because, you know, a lot of people, when they talk about UFOs, that's the first thing they think of. True. I think Kerry might have a point, though, uh, sort of out of frame of reference. Again, sort of going back to, I uh, sort of like her and alluded to it earlier, when I lived in Australia, and when I arrived in Australia, you know, I had a very northern hemisphere sort of uh, outlook on life, and I thought I knew what I was looking at. But believe you me, once I was in Australia and started living there for a couple of years and coming across sort of, you know, these these weird things that were actually living in my garage, like uh, blue-tongued lizards and stuff, and when you actually first see them for the first time, they do shock you. I mean, I saw this lizard, it had a big fat body, little legs come crawling out from underneath a pile of newspapers in my garage with a bright blue tongue. You never seen me move so fast. <laughs> and I went to work and I said, Oh, and are they poisonous? Is it this? Is it, um, um, is it that? And they were saying, Oh, you daft pom. And it's only a blue tongue. They're harmless. <laughs> so I can actually see if you do actually see something you generally have not seen before, you can sort of jump to quite wild conclusions. Mm. I mean, couple that when we talked about um, how adrenaline affects your emotional responses. Mm -hmm. If you saw something that outside your frame of reference, your adrenaline kicks in, your emotional response becomes conflicted um, and compromised, and then your brain starts putting things together and maybe coming up with 500 when it's actually something quite normal. I, you know, I don't know. Having said that, could you then really mistake a grey alien? If you saw a grey alien, which people have said, people have actually referenced, and, you know, when they say I've seen an alien, they draw it, and they come up with the same thing time and time and time again. Can we now discount that? I don't know. There's, particularly with the grey aliens, those seem, of all the alien sort of species that are purported to have been reported and throughout the years the grey alien does seem to be the one that has actually sort of stuck and it is quite continuous because before the greys came along there there did seem to be an evolution of uh, the alien species from like the nine the 1950s they were sort of like these blobby sort of things and then into the like the 60s they became more sort of nordic and stuff and a lot of people sort of tend to believe that this is more driven by popular culture than anything else but then i think the first depiction of a grey was uh, when whitley schreiber first released his book uh, communion was it and it had a picture of a grey on front and since then that and that came out in the late 80s i believe and since then it really does seem to have galvanized what a image of an alien is and they have not seemed to have developed from that which i find quite interesting well, see i mean well. with, with um again with the alien greys in particular um going into like the, the programs like the x-files they they seem, seem to link um, alien abductions with military operations. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, is it not feasible that it is actually a military operation to experiment on humans and they're just dressing up like these to make the conspiracy theorist people go a little bit more <laughs> mad over it? I've heard the theory that it's like a neoprene suit. So going on what you're saying, Paul... If they were testing out a form of suit because of the way that the... Maybe they're testing a new aircraft and the aircraft 
needs you to have some form of protection and they develop this neoprene soap, for example. I'm just throwing ideas out yeah. there, everybody I don't know. And then they've landed, got out to do whatever it is that they need to do, maybe test the environment, the local environment to see the effect of this new airship or spacecraft or whatever you want to class it as. <laughs> Purely human, totally human. And then some stra- you know, some walker or you know, hunter or whoever comes across it and goes, oh, my God, aliens. <laughs> and it's not, you know what I mean? It could be the military operation type thing that Paul's referencing, possibly. Yeah, but then, you know, you people, when they uh, report these sightings, it's normally like the aliens are peering through my window or they're standing in my bedroom or, do you know what I mean, things like that. Um, or they're actually on an operating table of some kind and they look up and they see these alien greys, mm-hmm. that tends to be the more reports that I've noticed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that sort of wouldn't really account for what you were saying. But um, there, is an, there is a definite evolution in regards to psychology regarding mm, the old hags in yeah. from, yeah. you know, depending on belief system, references, you know, when you get sleep paralysis and you, you see a horrible old hag, witch, demon entity, um, alien. Yeah. There is that, yeah. and that is cool. linked, and you can see an evolution of that through, depending on the belief systems and society and cultural influences. So I think you have to be very careful in regards to what is so deep fear, driven by media and propaganda in, mm-hmm. in our society and culture, in regards to alien invasion, going back from mm-hmm. H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds, to becoming a cultural deep set fear, and then that psychologically comes out, possibly. Yeah. So some yeah. of these could be down to that rather than an actual encounter. Mm. And going back to what you said, Kerry, you know, sort of like using a ward world as an example. I mean, that was sort of out for a novel for a relatively long time, but it really did sort of capture the imagination of everything when it finally went to film, mm. when sort of Hollywood got its hands on it with that, sort of, with, um, and with their version and ever since. So, uh, you know, because you look at the actual original novel of War of the Worlds, it's nothing like the depictions that uh, they sort of tend to show on screen now. The, you know, they just, I've sort of, and I've seen most of the adaptations and they've basically just used the name name the novel as the title of the film and that's about it really yeah yeah oh yeah i mean <laughs> artistic license and all that but all it doesn't that, change yeah. it doesn't change the fact that that i mean if you think of the jeff wayne version we've talked about this before the jeff wayne version yeah. i know that has had a huge influence on my negative response to anything ufology. It scared the bejesus out of me when that got released. My dad played it endlessly. It was a mm-hmm. massive, massive thing when it first uh, when it first got released. It hasn't lost its popularity to date. Um, but that, he played it and it scared me. And I was up, oh, I was probably about eight or nine at the time. I remember mm-hmm. it very, very clearly. And now, whenever we go down this route of talking of UFOs, aliens, you know, this kind of thing, I hold my hands up. I do not like this topic. It scares me. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's perfectly understandable. I can rationalise that, and I know where that fear has come from, but it doesn't change the fact that if if they come up on TV and said, oh, <laughs> meet Bob, friendly alien, just pop down to say <laughs> hello, I probably would start packing my stuff and heading for the hills. Because <laughs> I would be in my head, I'd be independent staying all over the place. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I can't deny that's probably how I would react because I have this fear that we wouldn't be able to control any circumstance if they wanted to be negative towards us as a race, that we we were outmastered or outmatched on every level, basically. Yeah. And I do not trust humans to be able to keep it peaceful. Mm. Yeah, that's a that's a fair enough point. And I can probably sort of see a lot of people sort of like our generation, you know, probably would feel the same way. You know, it's only sort of perhaps the latter sort of 
people sort of perhaps a bit younger than us that actually do just take it and in their stride, whether sort of people like like ourselves a bit old, a bit longer in the tooth that can possibly um, remember a time when life was a bit simpler and then suddenly we had this technological sort of advance with computers and stuff and the internet because we can all remember times when we didn't have it you know because we yeah. part back to them as oh and when i was a kid and we didn't have this we didn't have mobile phones so but we've actually lived through that and we still do have a bit of a sort of a, an inbuilt sort of prejudice against technology it, yeah. advancing you know because we always say oh christ what next we don't need that and stuff like that or or that's a bit suspicious five like the, uh, the old self checkouts can't stand them yeah well, again, yeah, but, you know, you brought up two really relevant points there. The suspicion regarding something simple, like a self-checkout, oh, it's going to take our jobs, you know, mm-hmm. we don't need to, em- it's companies not needing to employ staff, we're doing it all ourselves now, they should be paying us, I think I heard somebody say <laughs> on that yeah. one. Um, and the, you can see, in, in particular with the advances in regards to the internet speed, the 5G, yeah. how that's been responded to, and the yeah. whole, my goodness me, you couldn't have made up some of those conspiracies if you if you'd sat down and said, "Right, what can we make up today?" You know, and that was just on a technological in, in advance yeah, in regards on, to internet speed, right? On existing yeah. technology, I mean, but I can remember when cell towers first went up. There was always the the, the talk of a cancer, anyway. So this has always been underlying mm. within yeah. the like the conspiracy world and even before mobile phones and anything i was told specifically by my mum that if i watched too much telly i'd go blind yeah <laughs> and she generally believed that that's a, that's because when the tvs <laughs> were first invented the radiation output was really high <laughs> and that's where that stems from <laughs> Yeah, you know, sort of, it was a bit of technology and uh, the people that don't understand it sort of are sort of fearful of it and they will go around saying, oh, you know, you can't watch too because we know, you know, it probably damage your eyesight and after a long, long time, but that's probably more to do with old age. That's probably why I have to wear glasses now. <laughs> I wouldn't, but I wouldn't put it down to watching telly and when I was a kid. <laughs> do you think then people make correlations with things that have no correlation? Yes. Definitely. Definitely, yeah. All the time. Well, let's go to the next step then on this alien coming to Earth malarkey. <laughs> Some say they've already been here. And the only reason we are like we are today is because they genetically modified us to turn us into a slave race and then got what they wanted to get off planet and then off they mm-hmm. went and left us to it. Yes, the... Uh... The ancient yeah. alien theory. Alien theory, yeah. Again, uh, this theory has sort of, uh, it's developed itself. I mean, uh, it's a relatively new idea, sort of. It's, And you can see since the 1960s when this idea was first sort of like, uh, sort of like and suggested by people like Eric Von Daniken and Zachariah Stitchin, you know, it's sort of taken legs on itself. So it's evolved from there. And I've certainly heard of the, uh, you know, we were used as mining race for the Anunnaki to basically just to extract gold from the planet or something like that. Which might be, uh, well, we've only got 1% left in the entire planet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They took it all. Yeah. God damn them. They, they took it all. <laughs> Possibly. But Who that's, knows? <laughs> but that seems... I mean, now it seems to have got quite ridiculous. I mean, I used to enjoy a good dose of ancient aliens when it was first released you know it it brought up some interesting sort of stuff but but you watch it now and everything that has happened and throughout history you know even relatively modern history is all down to ancient alien and technology and i think that is quite insulting to us as a race okay paul what's your theory on that one yeah um i say i can understand to a point the ancient aliens, um, but I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not convinced. Um, I, I think a lot of it is being fed by, um, obviously, social media bringing more to our attention. 
but yeah. things things like the um, the helicopter on the hieroglyphs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, that, that sort of, that one comes up time and time again. And, you know, looking into it, we, we found that it is quite common that they used to over, you know, over time sort of write over some yeah. of the old hieroglyphs. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So putting two sort of motifs over each other, and that's, that's sort of what it come out as. Um, and a lot of people believe it's a helicopter when in actual fact it's just two different hieroglyphs um, one was from like Ramesses the second and I can't remember who the other one was like yeah or something, wasn't it? Um, yeah I can't remember but it, it was two different eras clashing and that was the outcome it was quite common at the time when one pharaoh passed or if a future pharaoh sort of had a bit of a gripe or didn't like something, they would they would go to their monuments and just overwrite them again, yeah, you know, literally, yeah. o- and just overcarve them. And oh. this is quite, it's quite clearly, and this is what it is. Yeah, you know, it's a very yeah. good example of it. It is, it is a really good example. <laughs> And it um, does only and, appear in one place, so we'd just like to point that out yeah, as well. But it, it's the still, way it's banded about, everyone seems to think it's... It's here, it's there, here, and there, everywhere. Exactly, and it's not. It's only actually in one particular... Yeah, um, and again, yeah. That, that's down to the media. Media-driven. Or is it people not researching them for themselves properly? They read one thing or hear one thing or watch one theory show and yeah. come up with, yeah. you know, and believe that without looking further. Because oh, the information is out there. I'm not going to, you know, the information on that, well, I found that relatively quickly. I mean, down to, then we talk about translation, don't we? How difficult mm. is it to find a piece of papyrus or a carved tablet or a hieroglyph or something like that and then actually work out what it meant? Mm. Right? So you've got a translation issue as well. So what somebody's translated, and I believe this happened with stitching, didn't it? He translated a particular passage which lent the weight to the entire theory, but then other other people have come along, retranslated that, and said, well, actually, it doesn't yeah. mean that. That's not what was said. Yeah. And one hieroglyph doesn't mean one word. I think that's the other thing. People kind of think um, it's one thing. It's a whole phrase. Yeah, that's yeah. right. I, I think, you know, a, a prime example of something like that we've come across... Um, quite recently when we looked into the green children of Warpit mm. um, I actually questioned well, the, the term green because that that is applied to someone that's quite innocent and naive yeah, you can call that them they're green, green around horns. a gill yeah, call them yeah, yeah. You know, yeah so is that something that it was lost in translation and they weren't actually green children they were just a bit innocent and lost yeah, very young children, like yeah. the main part of that, that story says they are. And if anything, the truthful part of that story, it, it's got a lot of sort of um, um, relevance in it. And they are very young children when they're found. And, and also so. another another um, explanation that we thought of, um, because Richard mentioned it actually, was mm-hmm. that at that stage in history, there wasn't a word for blue. And they called it yeah, the, blue green. It was a shade yeah, of green. So yeah, could they have actually was, been cold as well? Because when you go mm, when it's really cold, your skin has that blue tinge. So could yeah. they have just been cold to children? And I think there are more skin complaints or sort of like skin um uh, maladies that yeah, can that actually is, yeah. turn you blue as opposed to green because it is very rare to actually sort of get uh, you know, and they have actually looked into perhaps a skin complaint that turns you green, and they can't. You know, modern science have not really got one. Got one, but as for but, turning blue, there are quite a few complaints that can actually. Do but that, that. that's more that's more of a logical explanation than having mm. green children of Warpit. Mm. Yeah. Having said that, playing devil's advocate, there is still a hell of a lot about the ancients that we don't know and can't explain at this stage. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, yeah. You know, when you look at some of the buildings, you only have got to look at some of the buildings and how they're made and um, the technology that we believe that they had at that time would yeah. not have been capable of cutting the rock and then placing the rock. Mm-hmm. Some of the massive basalt 
um, blocks that they've used, and even down to the pyramids. I mean, they've got lots of theories, and I'm not saying that they're not possible or even probable. I'm not that good at physics and engineering to know. <laughs> um, but one thing I would say is the Egyptians did seem a hell of a head of their time at that time. Well, yeah, I mean, there's still wild theories going about around what the actual pyramids were used for. Mm. Um, I think the best one I've heard recently is that they were big batteries. Yeah. And yeah. the Egyptians actually had electricity. Yeah, there's so many. There's that, and uh, yeah, they were sort of like containers, sort of like for floods and stuff like that. They were sort of like grain stores. I think they've been put down to, and everything. I think what, but what the pyramids do actually tell us is uh, there was certainly for the people that built them. There's a lot of time, effort, and investment that went into them, so they must have been built for a purpose. Yeah, <laughs> quite I what yeah. that was, we don't know. But, again, you, we can't really get into the heads of the ancients and what their perspective and view of life was and what they considered important may be, to us, not important. Mm. Perhaps just building a, a religious structure to that sort of complexity was important to them. You can't, Did, de you can't deny that when you look at the, some of the cathedrals that have been built, the time, the well, effort, yeah. the carving, the, the skill that has gone into some of those uh, that you can go and see, you know, York Minster, you know, Canterbury Cathedral, all of those. When you look at those, that in itself is a feat in engineering for some of the age of the buildings. Yeah. Go back to, I don't know, Stonehenge times. That might have been their version of their cathedral. You don't know. It might not have actually had a purpose other than for pure worship. Well, yeah. Or for, yeah, for, for the people that built it to say, oh, and we can build this. Let's build it. <laughs> you know, it could be something as simple yeah. as that. But Bob sort of the like... builder comes into my mind yeah. when you said that. <laughs> can, uh, <laughs> and can we do it? Yes, we can. <laughs> <laughs> but again, sort of Stonehenge and stuff, I think a lot is lost with sort of like the Neolithic structures because we don't know what their thought process, processes were and the way they view the world they lived in, which I think has a lot to do with the impetus to actually be creative and build stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wild theories surround all of the top, all the areas we've covered tonight, um, in exactly the same way as the paranormal field, in, in a funny kind of way. It's just a different perspective. But people are looking at hardcore things that, you know, are tangible to touch and study and look at and, mm. and try and work out and translate and understand a time of reference we can't relate to. No, that well, I find that fascinating. So that is mm, sorry, sorry. That is the missing link. I feel, Kerry. It's uh, you know, we've got the physical evidence. You know, we can measure it and stuff like that and ponder it. What we are missing is the thought processes behind it. I think one yeah. thing's for sure in regards to um, War of the Worlds. It was a work beyond its time, and something that we, as a collective, if you like have taken and run with one way or the other, yeah. you know, um, for good and for ill. If they do come down and visit us and we get a definitive answer that there is life on other planets that are visiting us, um, it will remain to be seen, I feel, <laughs> on that one. It, it's sort of one of those things, isn't it? But with anything, bear in mind, there's a lot of theories. We, we know a lot, but we also know a hell of a lot not. I didn't yeah. say that right at all, did I? <laughs> no. Six of one half than the other, yeah. Yeah. We know what we know, and what we don't know, we don't know. We still know we don't know a lot. <laughs> That's right. Oh, yeah. I kind of got there in the end. Anyway, we're going to take a quick break at the moment. When we Kerry needs it. Because I need it, because my mind's <laughs> starting to implode with all this alien talk. And um, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to be looking at the next concept that H.G. Wells brought to the table. Oh, my goodness me. Paul loves this one, is all I'm going to say. We're going to have a little look at time travel, everybody. I'm going to take a little <laughs> nap for that, then. <laughs> <laughs> Paul likes to get the bit between his teeth on this one. So join us right after this. Hello, Harry Price here. 
If there's nothing me and my friends enjoy more here on the other side, it is to sit back and relax and listen to the Paranormal Concept Show right here on the PAUK Radio Network. Broadcasting a plethora of interesting and informative content for all your paranormal needs. Find them across social media to keep up to date with forthcoming shows and all their other adventures. Hello, is there anybody there? And welcome back to the Paranormal Concept Show, exclusive to the Paranormal UK Radio Network. Today, before the break, you heard us talking about the concepts regarding War of the Worlds, a H.G. Wells novel. And we're going into another of his novels now. We're going to have a look at the time machine and the (laughs) concepts and theories that surround that particular topic. Boys, the time machine. Yeah, brilliant book. Brilliant story. I haven't actually read the book. I've seen the several sort of adaptations through film and television, but I haven't actually read the book, unlike War of the Worlds. So this is all a bit new to me. Paul, do you want to give us a quick synopsis of what this one is all about? Okay, basically, um, a guy invents a time machine um, out of all the bits and pieces that you had at home, because that's what you did then. Um, <laughs> and like Kerry, she has a whisk and a can of beans. Yep. Oh, right. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. Um, but that's a different story. Um, and basically, um, he has, uh, whilst visiting a certain time period, he has a bit of an accident and he knocks himself unconscious. Um, and he set the time machine... Uh, he sort of fell against the buttons and stuff and he was transported billions and billions of years into the future um, where the human race had been turned into two different um, races if you like Um, one was called the Morlocks I believe they were the ones that lived underground and there was a race of people that lived above ground and they just had this big war between them Um, and that's pretty much the story. I don't want to try and spoil it too much, um, but that's sort of the general gist of it. Oh, so no cheeky spoilers with you then. No, no, no. no. <laughs> right. That's the basics of it. You get a machine, little time that's machine, and you can travel to any point in our Earth history. Yes. Correct. Correct. Firstly, would you do it? Uh, um, I'd travel back. At the risk tra- of changing history? Well, that's the age old um, conundrum, mm. isn't it? That's what they say, be, and be very wary of. You know. uh, I mean, travelling forward in time, I mean, would I do it? Uh, something I haven't really thought about uh, for a long time. Uh, probably not. I'll probably be quite apprehensive to be quite honest see by traveling forward in time you're removing yourself from the timeline from that point onwards so whatever point in time you're visiting in the future is a future without you in it so it would be a false future really potentially would you go back paul's already said he'd go back would you go back richard I would like to go back just simply for my interest in history and stuff. Yes, I, you know, and given that um, um, opportunity, yes, I would. Uh, it, it would have to come back with a few caveats, you know, would I be safe, you know, sort of and stuff like that. But I would much rather have, prefer to have a device like a television where I could observe. I perhaps would not want to go back physically. Mm. So, okay, if you go back, let's talk about going back first before we go forwards. <laughs> <laughs> any point in history, you had a little time machine, mm-hmm. you yeah. go any point in history, where would you go back to? Sorry for the ice cream van in the background, everybody, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to get louder. Off, it's yeah. getting closer. And, <laughs> and number 99, <laughs> Two flakes. <laughs> <laughs> So going back, where would you go to? What point in history would you go back to? I wouldn't go back too far because quite simply, I think if I went back sort of beyond the 18th century, you know, I think you would have a lot of problems understanding 
a lot of stuff going on, even just people talking to you and stuff, and you would stick out like a sore thumb. So I'd be more tempted to go back to, say, somewhere relatively sort of comfortable and close, sort of the mid-1800s. No no further back than the Napoleonic Wars, I would say. Right, Paul? <laughs> Uh, yeah, assuming obviously there were no complications like that, I would like to um, visit the time where the Roman Empire occupied the UK. Roman right. Britain. Roman Britain. That that yeah. would be really interesting. Um, going back to see what Stonehenge was actually used for would be a good one. Because mm-hmm. then I could come back and go, well, actually, this is exactly what it was. This is what they call it. <laughs> call it. And here's the blueprints. <laughs> Prove it. You know, and, and solve age-old mysteries like that. that that'd be quite good. Um, but I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think I'd probably be an observer. You'd so have to be. For instance. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Because there's the cause and effect issue, isn't there? Yeah. If you go back and you... you I mean, we've, we've, people have talked about going back and killing Hitler before he comes to power, right? That's, that's, right. A, that's always yeah. a favourite everyone talks about, isn't it? If you did achieve that in regards to you did manage to kill Hitler before he come to power, like, you know, Mm -hmm. that changes everything going forward. It does. So therefore it it creates a paradox because you couldn't, because when you went back to your normal time, your normal time would be different. Thus changing your personal history so therefore, you wouldn't be because you wouldn't not have the history of Hitler. You wouldn't then know to go back to kill him. So that cancels it all out. Yeah, and it would just revert back to the way it is. This is why I think that paradox alone, uh, sort of, I think going back in time is actually impossible. Mm. To actually do, I mean, even I think scientists and even just based on that paradox alone sort of have looked at it and said it's probably not uh, possible at all. Whereas going forward in time is uh, technically possible and it has actually occurred, not by sort of hundreds of years going forward, but you're talking sort of fractions of a second. But even that is still technically going forward in time. Mm. It is but then one you've, of got, those, you've also it? got to think that time is also a man-made concept. Yeah. So going forward in time is just a scientific fact, because you know, isn't it like the far, the the if if you travel closer to the speed of light, I think it is, mm-hmm. you're travelling faster than the rest. So therefore, you're going forward in time as opposed to like. Two seconds in your time, yeah, would be like I know I know I'm using the exaggeration, but a year in ours, yeah, yeah, it's certainly sort of uh, was it uh, not Newton's theory? That's certainly sort of Einstein's theory of the whole thing, isn't it? Sort mm. of time and time and moving forward in time is very relevant to motion. Yeah. So yeah, mm. because you know you have got to accept that what we consider time. Um, and how we measure time on Earth is relative again relative to to what we live, what we yeah. have made. We put it into a frame of context that again frame of context that we relate to. You know whether that be seasonal, whether that be hours and minutes, whether that be you know um, year, even down to years. And, and yes, that's based on our environment around us and what we've observed and we, mm-hmm. what we've diluted down into a time spectrum. You know, that might not be the same as what is observed on Mars or Alpha Centauri or mm. wherever, you know. Mm. The, the, That's you know, right. Going back to that. So you do have to consider that. And also, I think, going back to the Hitler thing, this is, see, this concept blows my mind. I just, I end up losing myself <laughs> in this concept because it's just, my mind goes bang. Um I wouldn't probably be born if Hitler had been killed because World War II wouldn't have happened in the way it happened. My par- my grandparents met through... My granddad was a soldier, my nan was a nurse. Yep. So they met because of the circumstance of the Second World War, who then obviously yep. had my parents. 
and you know, my one of my parents anyway, <laughs> 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 um, and my mum. So I may not have been born to yeah. actually go back in time in the well, first that, place that, to cause it, which, like Paul says, creates that paradox. So if you go back, just the fact that you've gone back, yeah, is a cause and effect. Yeah, and I don't even think it would be you would have to do something as dramatic as a sort of killing Hitler or something. I, I think the very effect of you stepping, say, if you were in a machine, stepping out of that machine and putting your foot on the ground or on the grass or something like that, that is that that could change everything. Just that simple act alone. Yeah, I mean, even even if you sort of, I don't know, say for example you're in australia for example and like you stepped on a spider yeah you know you you could have killed a spider that potentially could have killed someone else and their effect would have a national yeah effect so you know it Mm. it is it's it's very this is where it comes into the chaos theory isn't it we talk about Mm -hmm. chaos theory in regard to mathematics and stuff like that came out of lorenz's butterfly effect um, yeah. And he was looking at weather patterns. <coughs> Excuse me. He was looking at weather patterns, and a small, tiny, tiny change affected the entire weather pattern. Um, and it was only a, a 0.009 change or something in some graph or some other. It, mm-hmm. it had a m- massive effect on mm-hmm. the forca- forecasted weather forecasts. Um, that that's what Lorenz was looking at. And this is where the butterfly effect comes in. It's the chaos theory. Because yeah. the s- smallest change could affect a dramatic change for the future. And that is the problem with going back, isn't it? You don't know the smallest thing could cause a massive eruption for future history of how we know it. Yeah. How we yeah. know the future planned out if you went back. Now, going forwards. Yeah. Different concept, because like Paul says... The future's not written yet. We don't know what the future holds, much as many fortune tellers would say that they do. I don't (laughs) think many people actually forecast um, this situation that we're in now. I know there's been talked about, a few people have written about it, but, you know, science science fiction or or, um, comes up with some amazingly wonderful concepts and then they seem to happen and we go oh but that was predicted in that and it wasn't necessarily (laughs) it's it's just you know somebody's imagination a bit like war of the worlds right yeah um Mm -hmm. if if that has happened we'd now be saying oh hg wells actually predicted war of the worlds he didn't he just had a concept he just wrote a book and you know it was in his mind um and today thank god that hasn't happened but in regards to going forward forward with time travel this is a concept that's supposed to have been looked at, isn't it? And there's a very famous little experiment that um, is talked about endlessly. Again, we don't know if this actually happened. There's a lot of people who go, oh, I've got proof of this. I've got CAA files that says that. But there's a lot of people, again, have talked about this as if they were there. Um, and it's, a, it's another one of those, I kind of can't believe it. But maybe they did. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm obviously talking about the Philadelphia experiment. Yeah. Ah, oh, yes. I kind of knew this from a film. Mm-hmm. That's I the first time I came across this. Most people get their information. Mm. <laughs> most people get their information from the film. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. And I kind of looked into this a bit more and thought, oh, hang on. Hang on a minute. This is allegedly true. And I use the word allegedly because a lot of people dismiss this as a complete hoax. Um, But stories have been circulating for years and years. And as I say, there's a lot of people that say they've got proof of this and whatnot. And actually, if you look at the technology that's said to have been used, we know that some of that technology had been already developed to a point by Tesla and theories by Einstein. You know, so, so is it a case then of people taking theories from great minds, absolutely fantastically great advanced minds, um, in engineering, um, and then putting them on something that's redacted to a whole different level of redaction and coming to a completely incorrect conclusion? Or did they actually try it, do you think? What, the Philadelphia experiment? I don't think it actually took place. Uh, I think even the original sort of uh, 
proponent of the theory actually admitted he sort of uh, hoped it. You know, it was not all quite what it seemed. And the timeline of the boat as well, from when it was built to when this alleged experiment actually took place. I mean, the boat had only just been built and it was being refitted in, uh, it was being fitted out in New York Harbour. You know, they launch ships, the ships, you know, and when they launch a ship, it's not fully built. They just basically launch the hull. That um, That is a ship launch. And then it spent, the whole of its time when it was supposed to have been in, uh, was it Norfolk Harbour or in Virginia uh, where this experiment took place? It spent that time actually being re- uh, and fitted out for sea trials in New York. I mean, and that is actually documented. Mm. That's in naval documentation. And that alone would suggest that it didn't happen. Mm. Mm. A lot of people still yeah. believe it. Yes, yes. I mean, but say that is the compelling uh, sort of power of uh, media and television and film and stuff, because it was relatively unknown to relatively recently. I believe the author, uh, Charles Belitz, actually uh, wrote about it, and that's when it first took legs. That's when it really sort of became to the public attention. It was something that uh, was sort of stumbled upon. And uh, as for the Eldridge, I mean, the Eldridge actually stayed in commission right up until relatively recently. I mean, it went into the Greek Navy and uh, sort of in the the 1950s and it was still in service up until it was scrapped in uh, 1992. So the boat has actually still been around up until relatively recently. So So no soldiers fused half in, half out? things no nothing like that and the greek navy seemed to be quite pleased with it <laughs> <laughs> it was allegedly supposed to include experiments in magnetic invisibility which i can understand mm-hmm. you know to think the invisible yes um coat or whatever they call it things yeah. like this were being experimented on you know basically to uh, shield ships against detonating magnetic mines and this was actually used and known about by putting belts of uh, sort of like reflective uh, materials around the hulls of ships i mean we were doing this during the war and uh, this sort of thing. and if anything this could just be a sort of an embellishment of that sort of story sort of it was quite important for ships to be sort of proofed against magnetic mines which basically act when a ship passes over the magnet it breaks the magnetic field and the and the mine detonates but they were sort of like looking into ways of uh, preventing this from actually happening which they were actually quite successful with Mm. radar invisibility we work with that now don't we yes stealth stealth technology but for warship again you know of the the stuff they've done now with stealth technology for warships, you can still pick them up because it's that good now. It just comes up as a hole in the radar screen. Yeah. So you know, oh, there's something there anyway. So you're damned <laughs> if you do and damned if you don't. Damn, he hit my battleship. Okay. <laughs> stealth technology is more suited to uh, aircraft and stuff like that for obvious reasons. <clears throat> but for ships, uh, they are very difficult to conceal. No matter what you use. Optical invisibility, which Possibly. is actually being worked on. I would say yeah. this. I've seen, um, not so much on a ship per, per se, but, you know, uh, fabrics. You know, we talk about the Invisible Man. It's another H.G. Wells um, novel, isn't it? Yeah. And they are actually looking at, at optical invisibility um, as, as sort of a thing these yeah. days. I've seen experiments, sort of uh, watched a few sort of documentaries. They've sort of developed stuff for the military, and some of the stuff does look very impressive. You cannot see these people. Mm, that and they're is... standing in a room, you know. Yeah. It is quite something. I know. that That's a, a technology that they're, they're still looking at. But as in regards to whether or not they tried it on this ship with Tesla coils and God knows what else, I think the ship itself would uh, have lack of... reliable, credible evidence of its historical references throughout its usage um, if it had undergone any of these. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, military sort of records, especially during wartime, they were required to be kept, you know, logs and everything. And there is a bit of a gap, admittedly, sort of like around the October sort of time. But this can be put down to, um, for the uh, ship actually being fitted out and uh, uh, ready for service. Because oh. it actually sailed out for service in the in the June of uh, 1944, where it went to Bermuda to escort uh, uh, convoys and stuff like that. And then it just started its life as a convoy escort vessel. Quite sort of rudimentary sort of duties, really. Mm-hmm. Well, it is one of those um, things that gets talked about time and time again. I yeah. don't believe that this happened. I think this is purely no. um, a fictional thing. I think, you know, I don't... I don't know. Apparently, there was a lone survivor that has spoken about this, Alfred Bilek. But he in himself is very, um, <clears throat> how should we say this nicely? <laughs> I can't think of a nice way to say this. Discredible. Because <laughs> he didn't Mickey remember. Character. Yeah, well, he didn't remember this until he saw the movie. Yeah. So he's supposed yeah. to have lived through this, but didn't remember it until he actually saw the movie and went, hang on a minute, I was on that ship. <laughs> was you? Yeah. You know what I mean? I just think it's it's just far too much um, for your brain to, to take. But these theories or these, yeah, these cons- we buy into conspiracy theory because whatever fact you come up with in regards to discounting this experiment, somebody will say, yeah, but they faked the logs. Mm. Yeah, but this yeah. happened. Or yeah, you don't that's... believe it. Do you know what I mean? The, like I say, we go back to the beginning. You know, there's that always going to be a level of distrust and superstition um suspicion sorry not superstition suspicion (laughs) in regards to anything like this and this is the problem you have you could you know you you could have a massive high general military board go it's absolute bunkum why are you even thinking about this and why are we still talking about it in this day and age because it's so out of not going to happen and someone will say yeah but you're going to say that, aren't you? Of course yeah, you're going to say that. You're never going to admit it. Because when I knew we was going to be talking about this, I did actually sort of go off and sort of tap in the ancient, the USS Eldritch like service records and stuff like that, which are all available online. And uh, some of them are just quite run-of-the-mill, matter-of-fact military records. They just crew everything through the different stages of the ship's life. The ship survived work. And World War Two, and uh, so did a lot of the complement of the various crews that served on her as well. So you know there would have been a lot of people around, a lot of people around that survived the war and stuff, and nothing's really been said. It's always been put from what I've seen in the official documents and stuff like that. Uh, you know, it's just been put as a footnote. There is a conspiracy theory out that the USS. Eldridge took part in something known as the Philadelphia experiment, blah, mm. blah, blah, blah. They basically just go like that. I mean, they don't pay any stock to it whatsoever. No, I mean, and, and, you know, we're talking about that in regards to alleged time travel. Well, I think, you know, H.G. Wells comes up with the concept we could travel in time. It's not a brand new mm. concept, is it? You know, could we? The theory, if I could go back in time and change things... You know, we talk about that as a concept in just life. You know, mm-hmm. um, I wish I'd never met that person. If I could go back, I would have turned on my head or walked in the opposite direction kind yeah. of scenario. So it's not a new concept to us, is it, as humans, Paul? No, it's no, but certainly... I, will, I will say, though, in, in one of the adaptations um, on, I, I think it was, um, oh, I can't remember the actor's name, but the, basically the, the reason he invented the time machine was that, um, because his girlfriend was shot, I believe, mm-hmm. in, the, in one of the remakes. And he wanted to try and keep going back to change that outcome. But every time he saved her or she got shot a different way or, you know, yeah. he, he saved her from being shot. But then a little bit later, she was run over. It was like she was destined to die that night. And yeah. no what he'd done, he couldn't change that outcome. Mm. Um so, so then we talk about destiny then, Paul, don't we? If something's yeah. supposed to happen, no matter what you do, you're not going to be able to change that outcome. No, that's that's right. And, and there's, again, there's been loads of films about that sort of stuff anyway. Um, can you cheat death? I, I don't think you can. Uh, when, you name, when your number's up, your number's up. 
Well, yeah. I think what Kerry was saying a bit earlier, you know, it's sort of like it's it's that natural instinct in us. You know, we all wish we could go back time in, in time and change something. I mean, I, and I can remember when I had a little accident in, in my car. It was just a dent. I rolled it and into a wall. God, did that bug me? And I was sort of like constantly just trying to will to go back <laughs> and just touch the brakes a bit earlier, you know. And this sort of was on my mind for weeks afterwards, you know. And so there's certainly. We certainly have that yearning, but uh, I think that's all it is. I do not believe it's possible. I think that... Things do happen for a reason as well. You know, there's there's loads of times when things you think have gone bad, but they've always led to a better situation for yourself. Yeah. You know, so I do believe things do happen for a reason. So, yeah. Yeah, it might seem horrible at the time. Yeah. Yeah. But would you actually change anything? So there's the, there's the question on the table. What would you go back and change in your own life? Or would I, you... I wouldn't change. I wouldn't change anything because I would be a different person mm. if I, if I was to change anything. I wouldn't be me. Yeah, same here. I feel. I think we could all say that. I, I I have to say the same. Except we sit in a very again frame of reference perspective. Yeah. That, that nothing. I've done in my life has had that bad a detrimental effect on another person that I know of. That you're aware of, yeah, true. Aware that of I'm us. aware of. I suppose we can we can all say that. Yeah. But, but yeah. if you did know th- that you made a decision, it was the wrong decision, <laughs> and that had a, de- a massively detrimental effect to another person. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Um, you hear of it, don't you? You know, if I hadn't have gone out that night, I wouldn't have done this, and that person would still be alive today. You know, and because you're not a badly, in- you didn't intend to do that to another no. person. It it lays heavily on you, doesn't it? it that's the problem. It's the con- it's the ima- amount of consequence to actions you've taken. Yeah, but then if you if you think you know you you did that, there, there was a reason that you did whatever you did. The, the fact that it had an effect on someone else just means that it's their personal journey and it will lead them to something better. Not if, you, well, not if your actions will, led to them will, dying. No, mm. not, not to that extent, but it could make them stronger. But you have to make them stronger, they're dead. Um, you've got to live with the consequence of that, well, well, yeah, but <laughs> haven't you? That, but that's life, isn't it? It's mm. just the way it is. That and that's how life works and functions, and how it moves forward, mm. regardless of what sort of like consequences happen. I mean, it's 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 a constant evolving process. Mm. You know, people come, people go. Yeah, you know, it's that sort of thing. No, yeah, that's certainly true. You know, and as I say, it's not a new concept to people individual people of wanting to possibly yeah. change something whether go back or you know or i'm having a really crap time we hear it right now can we fast forward 2020 please i don't really want to see what the rest <laughs> yeah. of 2020 has got to offer because so far it's been a crap storm you know what i mean what else is coming at the moment we're talking meteors and god knows what else are happening oh, yeah. and like we haven't had enough this year um so you know, there's a lot of talk of, oh, if we could just jump forward, skip 2020, let's get on with 2021, see if that's a better year. You know, th- <laughs> that concept of moving time or moving yourself and your consequences in time mm-hmm. is not abnormal to the human race, is it? I, d- I don't know many people that live completely in the present moment. It's actually a very spiritual perspective. Keep yourself completely in the present and embrace <laughs> that moment. You know, um, it's, that's a very spiritual perspective of staying right in that present moment. But that's yeah. very difficult. We always look past, present, future. Our perspective yes. is past, present, future. Decisions we make are, are affected by what's happened in the past, which will affect the future because your decision will affect what happens in the future. Yeah, mm. because they are basically our personalities and stuff. And there are basically three of us. We have sort of like a <gasps> a parent, a sort of like a, a normal sort of state, the current state and the child state, which is, as you say, past, present, future. And we, and we are constantly sort of like skipping between one and the other. You know, you really need to get to your, your sort of current state because nothing can really affect you in your present state. I know that's a very sort of spiritual way, but if but if you do work it and can and are fortunate enough to 
be able to work that sort of way of living. It is very true. You know, you it's, could lead a, a lot better, a lot more sort of peaceful, satisfying life. Do we think then people in the past lived more that way than we are able to now? Yes. Uh, they, and they were more accepting of the circumstances they were in. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it it just was, well, it's like this, let's, and let's get on with it. And I don't think, uh, yeah, I'm sure, you know, we, our ability to reflect on the past and speculate on, on the future is a luxury we've acquired through our sort of modern living, I suppose. You know, we have a lot more sort of free time to ourselves and we can, and we can step out from occasion from the, the roundabout world around us and actually think about these things. Whereas I think people in the past who were sort of more or less just getting on day by day, you know, they live more day day by day as opposed we plan things week, weeks ahead. I right. mean, and that is a luxury. So this brings us to a concept now. We've had three months where we've stopped. Yes. We've had a chance to take stock of our lives mm-hmm. in a way that we... The, I've never had before in my life. No, same here. Paul, I've been working for it. So. <laughs> <laughs> the majority of sure? us, <laughs> the majority yeah. of us, have had that time to take stock to stop. Mm-hmm. We're not able to go out. We're not filled with the day-to-day humdrum of work and routine, and you know, the, your day-to-day life runnings. And, and the stresses and, and worries that that brings is within itself. We've, yeah. been, we've been able to stop and take stock. Do you think then, guys, that this will change the future? Yeah, I would hope so. You know, you're dealing with uh, people here, aren't you? <laughs> this is true. <laughs> <laughs> that is the unknown of commodity. But sort of like... Thinking about it, you know, there's a basic thing, and we've all said this. I mean, I have lost, and I know you, Kerry and Paul, have lost track of what day it is. Yeah. yeah. But there are days I, about that... I literally remind myself every day what day it is. I look at my diary, yeah. even though there's nothing in my diary at the moment. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but that concept alone, but at the end of the day, you know, I sort of like look back on that when I'm struggling to think of what day it is. I think, well, is it important? <laughs> you know, this is what it must have been like. <laughs> For our sort of Stone Age ancestors, they never knew what bloody day it was. <laughs> yeah, just rolling from day to day. It's more like the weather yeah. I'm more worried about. Is it going to be a nice day or a horrible well, that's day? It. I mean, <laughs> you know, ev- everything happens for a reason, you know, and the state of the planet at the time when all this kicked off, you know, there, there was a lot of stuff going on about um, the, the ozone and, mm. you know, the, the planet's literally exhausted mm-hmm. We, mm-hmm. we need to stop what we're doing we stopped and now yes. scientists are saying well actually it's been good for the planet massively you know so it's helped the planet it's helped a lot of people within like self-reflection mm-hmm. yeah you know, so when we come out of this whether you're a, you, you probably will end up being a better person for it you know there, there's going to be people out there that you know are going to be dubious about going back out into society, you know, so it's changed them a little yeah. bit for the worse, but, you know, they, they'll be better for it in the long run because, you know, they, they'll get back to normal and, you know, they might be a little bit more thoughtful about other people and, you know, and, and just stuff like that, you know. So I think it is it was, it was a good thing. We did need it. I've certainly noticed something even, you know, now we're sort of, the restrictions are sort of easing a bit. I've sort of been out a bit and more. And people are sort of, you know, you're doing this very un-English thing of speaking to someone you don't know on the street. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and how radical is that? Oh, gosh. But in the UK, it's like, you know, we're, we're famed for queuing, but queuing in silence. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you don't talk to the people either side of you. Um, and actually, the two-metre distance, people are actually still are talking to each other in that two-metre I think, you know, Whereas that I... takes away the pressure of being up close, doesn't it? So you have to verbalise more. You have to communicate. And we're perhaps learning, yeah. new sc- sort of grounding ourselves back in these old communications skills. Yeah. Well, it I've, has, I've it spoken has also, to more people. I, I do find that when we have major incidents and stuff, 
we we do revert back to that community spirit, mm. you know, you and yeah. we've seen it with like the NHS clap on a Thursday. I know we've finished it now, but every Thursday people were out there clapping the NHS, you know, and it brings that closeness. Although we're distancing, it does bring us closer together. And we see it in other, you know, when there's like bombs and things go off all over the UK. And, you know, it does bring the the community together. I think also it showed um, gratitude. Yeah. Mm. You know, things you take for granted on a day-to-day basis, like, you know, the health service and stuff like that, the people working in the health service. You take it for granted, it's there, you use it, you know. Um, and, and it was very take it for granted. Whereas yeah. now, you get to a pandemic, they're the ones you go, thank God. Thank God we've got that. You know That's what I mean? Thank and God there's might... people prepared to go to work every single day through a pandemic. And that brings you to the present. You're grateful in that present moment. And again, very mm-hmm. spiritual, a very spiritual term. It makes you, um, you know, we say be grateful for what you've got in the present moment. And I think, like you said on the Thursday, the clap thing, it made people be very present in that moment and be grateful and gra- show gratitude that we are interconnected as people. You know, we, we can't, yeah. we are tribe of people effectively. We work as a collective yeah. and it's, we rely on, on each other. That's another thing that came out from the, the, I, I the think, situation. You know, in in <clears> day to day life, we are very distant with each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But when it's needed, we are a group of people that will stand up together mm-hmm. and get the job done, get what's needed. I mean, through, through this COVID period, um, the NHS has needed support. Yeah. And because I'm in a position of the St. John, I because I was on the at-risk register, I wasn't allowed to go out and help frontline. Mm-hmm. Um, so I joined a particular team was set up in response to COVID mm-hmm. to help with recruitment. We recruited nearly 2,000 people to go into the hospitals to help support the NHS yeah. on behalf of St. John. And, you know, just did, by doing that, I've, I've been helping support in that way. Um, you know, and yeah, it's, it's just something that we can all do. So we all do mm-hmm. get together. I mean, it, it doesn't matter whether or not someone like me doing what I did or someone just even staying at home. They're, they're helping the NHS by staying at home um, and not spreading the virus. Mm. Uh, I think that's, I saw so many community in my local community, um, people stepping up. Yeah. Helping the elderly that couldn't get out or were worried. People that were shielding the high risk if they caught it. You know, um, even down to, I've probably done more for my mum and dad than I would normally because they're very independent people. Mm. They're normally, they're 100% all right normally and they get on with their life, you know. <laughs> but Whereas, if you had elderly neighbours, you could have yeah. checked on them. A lot of communities set up their own Facebook groups yeah. to help the elderly in their communities. Mm-hmm. You know, so we all had the right idea. We all knew what was needed. Yeah. We filled that gap. Yeah. We supported each other. And that's what the British are really good at. I think that's what people are. Just because we didn't see it in other countries so much, it, because of obviously we get UK reporting, um, yeah. doesn't mean that it didn't happen. So I think that's a worldwide no, I'm, I'm thing. Not, I'm not saying that, but then I do, you know, we, we do watch the news and, okay, we're not told everything that happens in... Say, for example, in an American community, um, sometimes we only just see the worst. But there, there are groups of people out there that will help and support. Yeah, very much um, so. But I think that's what the British do best. I just think, I go back to the beginning, um, and it was something very simple. Mm. And Italy was singing. Yeah. Yeah, we all remember that, yeah. You know, and they were all locked down. But to keep people's spirits up and feel connected to each other. I know Italians are well known for fam- close family connections and that community within themselves, you know, um, big families and stuff like that. So to, mm. to help them feel that they were still um, connected to each other, they started singing to each other. Happened in yeah. Spain as well. Um, I, you know, I've got friends out in Spain and they were saying, oh, it's great. We go out on the balcony every night and there's a big sing song. <laughs> you know, <laughs> But little things like that show how people can come together in times of adversity in the present moment. Yeah. 
when you have something that you're faced with in that present moment, would you change something? Probably. There's probably a lot in hindsight. Hindsight's a wonderful thing. Oh, that we would go, so. if we could go back in time, we would change it, but we can't. So mm. we're not able to. So we can't play the blame game. We've got to look at what it is. Yeah. The situation is this. We reacted in this way. That's, you know, personal responsibility of how you react. But I think it does show we're all interconnected. And if we were able to time travel, the biggest mistake would be to try and go back and try and change something because we don't <laughs> yeah. know the effect. Um, I, I want to bring in, um, I want to sort of, because we've gone very community and, and current, mm -hmm. I want to sort of bring another beautiful little conspiracy theory to the table. Oh, why not? Comes back actually off the Philadelphia experiment of this time travel thing, which was the Montac conspiracy theory. Um, where, you know, they, it was looked at. And the trouble with I have with all of these conspiracy theories is the it's not just we tried to do, you know, time travel, mm -hmm. but we had aliens involved in that too, and we had this involved in that, and then they, they, they stole children to do this. But, you know, they, but the, the purposes of the um, listeners that don't know what the Montec project is, what was it? Oh, sorry. It was supposed to be, again, a secret government project that looked into time travel. And what it did was they allegedly took some um, orphan boys, brought them into the, the thing, and it used psi kind of experiments on them to see what they could affect with their mind. But within that was time travel and stuff like that. So it was okay. all... Aliens mm -hmm. were supposed to be involved, and there's the Montac chair, and the actual place is there, and it's all built, oh, not brick type, you can't go in it, you know. But the site itself is actually, um, was a massive radar station um, in its day. But again, it's a whole conspiracy theory that is all linked in with this um, this guy, um, what was his blinking name now, um, B. Bilek. Um, from the Philadelphia experiment, it was also supposed to be part of the Montauk project, and it, oh, I, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> it all gets interlinked. And he had witnessed aliens there, but it was if you think Stranger Things, yeah, yeah, if you've seen the Netflix series Stranger Things, it, that's kind of where they got the idea for Stranger Things from was the Montauk experiment, where they'd put somebody in a chair and see if they could get them to do science experiments and what effects they could have with, with, um, you know electrodes on the brains and stuff like that but again it's like it's mind control more than time travel from the montage but again it buys into the same person she's yeah. been making a bit of a career out of this isn't it? it was supposed to be somebody else he changed his name and it all becomes very very murky and crappy quite frankly and i just don't understand why people buy into this and oh i don't know I just find it, these far too back crazy for my liking. I just think it's a lot of I said, he said, she said, but I can't prove it because it's um, it's government controlled and everything's been red acted or um, denied. Mm -hmm. yeah. But then we go to the point of plausible deniability, which we know governments use. So who knows, right? I could be completely wrong thinking this and it could be that they were doing it. I don't know. I haven't really looked too deeply into this because it doesn't but, seem I mean, when, to myself. When it, comes, when it comes to looking into the future, I, I think it's a case of it's not written yet. It hasn't been decided. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's no way that you can actually look into the future. And this is the the problem I have with fortune telling and tarot when it comes to guiding people to the future mm. because it is almost like you're telling them a possible outcome and it's down to them yeah mm -hmm. it's down to them whether they take go in that direction but they could be going in a completely di different direction through choice but that's why when you do a reading you have to you state at this this is only based on the situation as it is today you have free will yeah. this can change because of your decision that's and you your say. decision I mean, the, could change from an emotional reaction to something somebody says to you. In in that case, then it, that's 
in that possibility, mm. then you're giving them a false reading because that's not what's going to be happening. No, you're not changed... because at that point in <laughs> at that point in that present moment, that is the forecast. All right, okay. You're not giving them a false reading because at at this moment you're, in time, you're still giving them a possible outcome. You're giving them a possible outcome on the situation yeah. as it is today. However, everybody has yeah. free will. So I could read for you, Paul, and I could yep. go, this is how it forecasts for you from this point on as things stand today. Yeah. However, it can change. Your girlfriend has got free will. She could make yep. a decision that affects your future and that's out of your control. That's going to affect your forecast. Yeah. But I'm not reading her, I'm reading you. Mm. Do you see what I mean? I could warn you yeah. that you've got some emotional turmoil coming. Watch out. There's some emotional turmoil coming in the future. I don't know what that necessarily would be. Because yeah. it's... The future is... You view it through a, a shroud, as it were. It's unclear. It's ever-changing. You can't yeah. call it. You can give a possibility. You could be... This is a possibility based on the, 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 the situation in your life as it is today, regardless of whether I know you or not. Yeah? Mm-hmm. I can do that in regards to tarot, but it's only one of probably like a million possibilities because your future and your free will and your decisions and your choices are so influenced. Your emotional yeah. responses are so influenced, which is why you look at the present situation and, and a possible past influence on the future going forward. Mm. And that that's where you've got to be very careful with what you say. Because you can't say you and also this is the other thing, a disclaimer you put out. You I am not responsible for any decisions. You you don't make any decisions off the back of a of a reading. Yeah. You you don't. Because it's a possibility. Yeah. And if you no, go no, away and go, Well that tarot that. reader told me that I was gonna do this, this and this and this <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And it turns out the worst thing ever you could possibly have done, you can't blame the tarot reader because it was your decision to do it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Even though some argue that even the pos- knowing a possibility could change the future. Yeah, because you can, you can make it happen. You can make it fit. You can but any reading you but can then make it, that fit, would be you? your yeah, but that would be your decision to do. Yeah, no, mm-hmm. I, I get that. Yeah. Yeah, so that's sort of... Before I start any tarot reading, that's what I say to everybody. I've done it for, you know, yourself and Richard when I've done yeah. readings for you. Mm-hmm. Even though you know that, because we've talked about this quite freely without readings going on and stuff like that, we've talked about yeah. this concept. Even though whenever I start a reading, I will always start the same because it's good practice yeah. to, as a reminder... And also, if I was doing somebody I didn't know, that would be very relevant because I can't promise them you're going to have fame and fortune, you're going to get married, have 14 babies, you know what I mean? (laughs) Because it's so shrouded and so influenced by the present moment and the people you're surrounding yourself with at this moment in time, and it might not because it's only a possibility. It's a very, very um, sketchy future readings are very sketchy. You should never take them as read. You might look back in hindsight and say, this is the the past, present and future. At the present, there's a possibility of going forward. If that plans out, that possibility plays out, I will then look back at that reading and go, God, that was accurate. Mm -hmm. Or I could look back and go, that was a load of crap, wasn't it? (laughs) But that didn't happen, did it? But But what that reading was based on could possibly have been a change happened because of an external influence on my life that I, I didn't know. Yeah, that, that, know? that makes sense. It's, 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 as I say, reading the future is very, um, well, yeah, pinch of salt. Even I read that, even for somebody who reads them, it's very, uh, you know, a lot of disclaimer to be put onto that. So you aren't influencing somebody's life. It's a reading. Yeah. It's a, it's a possibility. Um, in my opinion, this is obviously everybody. And, you know. and I think that's why, as well, it's important for mediums that do give readings to have insurance, because there okay. is going to be one person that you say that to, and they go, "Well, actually, I done this to make that happen, and it's your fault." Yeah. And they will take it as far as going to court over. Yeah. Because um, I've I've read the stories, you know, I've seen things like that happen before. 
Um, so, yeah, it's, it's important that anyone that does the readings to have the insurance. The thing is, I think future readings is very different from um, like a medium reading. You're reading the past, effectively, yeah. because you're reading with somebody that's past. So it's a past reading, isn't it? Because that person has passed over. Yeah. You know, they've gone. They're somewhere else. If you believe that spirits exist and that we have life after life, you know what I mean? So it depends on what you're going for a reading for. And that's the other thing. Whenever someone comes for a tarot reading, I'm like, I have to reiterate, I'm not a psychic. I can't pick up your Uncle Bob. You know what I mean? If you if you want a message from your, a loved one, that's, that's not what I do. I can't do that. You know what I mean? Very rarely do I get um, people in that way. I get information coming through, but who it's come from, I don't know. Where it comes from, I don't know. Yeah. But mm. for me, I'm reading a tarot reading and I'll read stuff that maybe not actually from a traditional meaning of a card come through. That's just my intuition working. You know what I mean? That's how I put it. It's just my, that's how I work personally. But mm. You go to a psychic medium, they're, they're reading a past, aren't they? Because it's a past life that they're reading yeah. from. Where that comes from, we don't know. It's a theory. They mm. swear blind they can do it. And I've had some phenomenal readings from people that have no clue about my, my past family and, and past life and, you know, things I've done in the past. And I've had some phenomenal... Re- are they mind reading me? Are they picking it up from a, a collective cloud? Are they? I don't know. Who knows? We don't know. It comes down to what do you believe? What are you putting out there? Are you projecting it? I don't... I can't... I haven't got the answers to that. Yeah. Nobody's got the answers to that. Mm-hmm. You can say my belief system is we have life after life. So my nan comes and talks to me. But that could be yeah. what my mind psychologically is bringing forward for me. Because I'm, I miss my nan. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's very difficult. It's a very difficult mm. one. And, and it, it's very divisive in that respect. Because yeah. it's... You've got the people that, no, spirit don't exist. We can't prove it. That, you're right. We can't. Yeah. But... There's some really interesting experimentation that's been done that you can't deny. Mm -hmm. And that raises a hell of a lot of questions. Yeah. Like concepts, like time travel, like concepts, like if aliens came down from another planet. Again, hell of a lot of information out there, a hell of a lot of personal circumstances on that. You know, I've had an encounter with 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 an alien entity, you know, and you sit there and... For somebody who's not had that in their frame of reference, goes, oh, my God, that is complete beep. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> but, but that person is expressing their personal experience to you. How they've interpreted it or how you interpret what they tell you comes down to very much belief system. Yeah. Yeah. So you can be sceptical to a point. But if someone's relating a personal experience to you, in the same way as if you, you're coming across a, a ghost hunter who says, we were there at a location one night, this happened, that's their personal experience. You can't turn and go, you're lying, because that's their yeah. personal experience. When I do work that I do, that's my experience of having how I work. I, you, we can question it. I've got no problem questioning it and discussing it and looking at what it could be other than spirit you know paranormal effectively but ultimately unless you experienced it for yourself it's very easy to dismiss yeah and you shouldn't dismiss without examining it and discussing it i've researched this you know these conspiracy theories to a point for me i'm not kind of a conspiracy theorist i I, I can't it doesn't, but it doesn't interest me, right? I hold my hands up to that. I've got no time for it, really, but I will research it to a point. And then give me something like Poltergeist, and I'm a lot more well-read about that because that interests me more. That concept yeah. interests me more. But I mm. wouldn't dismiss if somebody came to me with a conspiracy theory. I would question it, but I wouldn't dismiss it. So I've spoken to abductee 
um, experiences and I've spoken to people like that I would never turn around and say oh you're just absolutely bon you're bonkers what the hell do you yeah. think you're doing I wouldn't do that to somebody because that's not fair just because it's out of my frame of reference yeah if you've got two abductees together in a room and they start comparing notes on their personal experience again it raises a lot of questions mm. but it shouldn't be dismissed yeah. And if possible, particularly with the conspiracy theory, some of the things we've talked about tonight in regards to the time travel and ancient aliens, and <clears throat> all that, all those concepts we've looked at tonight, you have to look at it and go, okay, that's one, that's one possible explanation. Yeah. Might seem the most crazy out of them all, the most least rational. Yeah. If that makes sense, but you can't dismiss it. Because we can't prove it either way. Yeah. And and that's how I see, that's how I look at things in this field. I don't, part of my rational brain will be dismissal, but my logical brain is also going, okay, so what could that have been then? Rather than going, oh, that's just crap, and then walking away. That's, that doesn't yeah. solve anything. It doesn't get you the answers. That doesn't get you anywhere. So even the most sceptical person out there can research the heck of something. We've talked about the difference between sceptics and critic, uh, cynics. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a very big difference. It's not a bad thing to be sceptical. No. It gives you a point of something to research. And if you can research it and then debunk it, we've got an answer. Yeah. And that's a good thing. Like the old factor. Mm -hmm. We've got an answer on that. A pretty in my view, my personal opinion, a pretty definitive view on that. Mm. Because it got looked at. It got looked at extensively, you know. And, th and they came to a, a complicated but logical assumption based on camera workings and the evolution. Again, you can see an evolution of orbs through well, camera yeah. technology developing. So it, it, there you go. You know, we've got a body of work that we've looked at. And that's where you have to sit, you know, with any of this. And this is, I've yeah. talked about this in a blog recently, about the conflict between the spiritual and, and the scientific. I, I hate to use the word scientific because I'm not scientific. I wouldn't like to label myself as that. But sceptical, perhaps. The, the spiritual and the sceptical, that, you know, bridging that knowledge, bridging that, that I don't know. Anyway, I've talked, I've waffled, guys. <laughs> you let me waffle. Went off on one. Me, I went off on one. But I think that's <laughs> what you have to think of, you know. Anyway, carry on. <laughs> <laughs> she said too much, but didn't say enough. <laughs> well, uh, we've come to the end of the show now. We? <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have actually pretty much come to the end of the show. <laughs> what have I missed? I've just come in from watering the garden. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, I went off on a little one there at the end. Oh, oh nice. dear. A good Kerry rant. Quick, kick like. that soapbox away from us. <laughs> I do love a little soapbox <laughs> moment. Anyway, that is the end of the show, guys, I'm afraid. Anyway, so HG Wells brings lots of concepts and theories to the table that quite raises so many questions in your mind and can take you down so many different avenues of thought. As you know, we've questioned each other quite, you know, on views and, and theories and opinions and, you know, all sorts of things tonight rather than um, a hardcore research topic. Um, but hopefully we brought some topics or some some areas that made you think next week <laughs> we have got the lovely Gareth Hughes in the studio with us. He is. Um, oh, he's a brilliant, brilliant person, works shamanically um, and is very earthright. Um, kind of person. We're embracing our spiritual next week, boys. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've got my drum ready. I'll bring that along. Yeah, we're looking at all that kind of thing and, and how we can um, utilise that in our day-to-day -day workings. <laughs> On that note, we'd like to say thank you for listening. Um, don't forget, go over to paranormalconcept.com where you'll see all of our blogs and um, all the latest shows that go up on there. And uh, if you Check us out over on our Facebook page, Paranormal Concept. You'll see lots of information and, and all, all sorts of wonderful things, even caption of the day we do occasionally <laughs> over there. So go check us out over there. And if you'd like to get in contact with either of us or any of us either, 
all of us, Eva, any, all any of us, of us. yeah, and you. <laughs> then you can message us through that page as well. On that note, say good night, guys. Good night, guys. Good night, guys. No one would have believed in the last years of the 19th century that human affairs were being watched from the timeless worlds of space.